Let's begin reading here in Romans 3 at verse 1. I'll read verses 1 through 8, and we'll get into our study. Romans chapter 3, beginning at verse 1, reading to verse 8. The Apostle Paul writes, What advantage then has the Jew? Or what is the profit of circumcision? Much in every way, chiefly because to them were committed the oracles of God. For what if some did not believe? Will their unbelief make the faithfulness of God without effect? <laughs> Certainly not. Indeed, let God be true, but every man a liar, as it is written, that you may be justified in your words and may overcome when you are judged. But if our unrighteousness demonstrates the righteousness of God, what shall we say? Is God unjust who inflicts wrath? I speak as a man. Certainly not. For then, how will God judge the world? For if the truth of God is increased through my lie to his glory, why am I also still judged as a sinner? And why not say, let us do evil that good may come, as we, have, as we are slanderously reported, and as some affirm that we say, their condemnation is just. As I've been mentioning to you in our introductions, the Book of Romans is what has been referred to as a systematic theology. It actually gives to us information related to God and God's works on planet Earth. And Paul has been writing concerning these things, these are fundamentals, in order that the Church of Rome may have an established faith, something that is founded on factual information, something that is founded on the things of Scripture as God has been revealed through the Word of God. And as we've been looking at Romans, we saw in chapter 1 how he had begun his argument that all mankind is under sin. He began with the Gentiles, and he pointed out that the Gentiles are sinners by nature. They don't know God. And as a result of their not knowing God, because they have rejected him in the way of thinking, they have turned to idolatry. Then he moved into chapter 2 and began to speak concerning the Jewish nation and began to speak concerning the things related to them. And as he'd been writing concerning the Jews, he was speaking of those things that, that the Jews themselves would consider to be spiritual advantages. They had things that, uh, that they could point to. They were Abraham's descendants. They were people who had received the law of God. And even as he just a moment ago mentioned, they had received the right of circumcision. All of these they would consider to be advantages, and in a way they are, and in another way they could be a disadvantage because the more that they have, the more accountable they are. Great advantage always results in greater responsibility. And so the more that you have and the more that you know, the more you're going to be held accountable for. And in the case of the Jews, they had something called the oracles of God. Notice how he had stated that in verse 2 when he said, uh, what advantage do they have? Well, much in every way, chiefly because to them were committed the oracles of God. So he says they have the word of God, and the word of God that they've received was something that was specific, specifically given to them to be an advantage to them in that God gave them their laws. When you look in the Jewish laws, the law of Moses, a lot of times we speak concerning the law and we think in terms of uh, the Ten Commandments, and I'll look at that in just a moment, but in reality, Jewish law had 613 commandments that the rabbis during the time of Paul had basically extrapolated from Scripture. And so they had 613 specific commandments. 248 of them were positive, and 365 of those commandments were negative. And so Paul is making it very clear that because they have these commandments, they're very accountable to God. Now, he never taught that the law of Moses had no value. In fact, the law of Moses bestowed spiritual advantage to the Jewish nation. Because in the law of Moses, especially in what is called the Decalogue or the Ten Laws or the Ten Words, the Ten Commandments, in those ten words that God gave, there was a great advantage to them because the advantage was, would be that they, they knew God and they knew God's desire for man. When you look at the Ten Commandments, and we speak about them here in our society fairly often when people begin to say, should the Ten Commandments be posted in courthouses or should the Ten Commandments be found in schoolrooms? When you look at those Ten Commandments, you can see the tremendous moral foundations that you could receive if you simply believed those things and tried to act on what you believed. 
Because Exodus chapter 20, verses 2 through 17, lists what are called the Ten Commandments. And, 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 and let me read them to you so that you can see the value of them. God in, in Exodus chapter 20 says, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. God said, you shall not make for yourself a carved image. He said, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. He said, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Honor your father and your mother. Thou shalt not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not cover your neighbor's house or anything that he possesses. These 10 basic commands were given to the nation of Israel. And if they were to be following these commands, then the, the nation would be blessed by God. There's a great advantage to keeping these things, to doing these things. I was uh, interested in the amount of commands that we have, the amount of laws that we have, and I wasn't able to find anything that is up to date. I, I found something out of the year 2010 that I found interesting. In January, January 1st, 2010, the United States as a whole, as a nation, um, wrote into law another 40,627 laws. Think about that. That's in one year, and that's two years ago. 40,627 new laws. It's been stated that the more evil a nation is, the more the laws they need, and I think there's some truth to that. 40,000 new laws to break, because that's what we do with laws. They bring laws, and we break those laws. But God was making it very simple for man. He said, listen, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give to you two tablets. I'm going to give to you obligations to God and obligations to man. The first four commandments pertain to how you are to be with God. The last six pertain how you're supposed to be with other human beings. And, and so if you follow these things, these guidelines, you can have a blessed life. On one occasion, a, a lawyer had approached the Lord Jesus Christ, and he asked a question, what is the great command in the law? And Jesus responded by giving the most copied, the most memorized, the most prayed command that you find in Scripture out of Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 through 9. And it says here, O Israel, the Lord thy God, the Lord is one. Love him with all your heart, soul, strength, mind. And he, Jesus said, this is the great commandment. But then Jesus went on to say, there's a second like unto the first. He said, thou shalt love your neighbor as yourself. Now what, what the Lord was doing is basically taking the Ten Commandments and he was basically giving us two. One, love God with everything and love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. If you give God what is his due, then you're going to love man because to love man is to first love God. John asked in one of his epistles, 1 John, he had said, how can a person say, I love God, when he hates his brother? How can a man love God whom he has not seen and hate his brother whom he has seen? How can you love the invisible God and hate those who were created in his image, is what John was saying. So what are you saying? Well, to love God with all of your heart is to be expressed in your love that you have for people. Uh, Paul, later on in the book of Romans, in chapter 13, verse 9, is going to say that the, the law, at least the law as it pertains to human relationships, is summed up in one word, to love your neighbor as yourself. And so the Jews had received God's law. God's law declared how they were to be with him and and how they should live their lives out amongst themselves with other people. And, and so Paul is making reference to that here in Romans chapter 3 when he asks the question, what advantage then has the Jew or what is a prophet of circumcision? And then he answers it much in every way, chiefly because to them were committed the oracles of God. Obedience to the law isn't possible. The law is something that you're commanded to perform or to do but you don't have the power to do. So what the law was intended to do, amongst other things, was to, besides laying the moral foundations of society and developing the foundations for a relationship with God, the law was also intended to awaken me to my sinfulness and to direct my footsteps to the one who could save me. Seeing that I can't be a perfect human being, I need somebody who is, somebody who's able to do those things that the law commanded that I'm unable to do. And so the law awakened the need of a Savior by revealing 
sinfulness and hopelessness and then directs you to Jesus Christ because salvation is through faith in Christ by the grace of God. But unfortunately, that's what the Jewish nation was rejecting. And so Paul is addressing that. And again, he says, what advantage then has a Jew or what is the profit of circumcision? And then he supplies their answer, the answer by saying, great in every respect. But the greatest advantage is they've been given the oracles of God. They've been given the utterances of God. They've been given God's word. Now, when you read your Old Testament, you'll discover that God established a beautiful relationship with the nation of Israel. God chose the nation of Israel out of all the nations of the world and made them specifically his own special people. In Deuteronomy, in the Old Testament book of Deuteronomy, chapter 10, verses 14 and 15, we read, Indeed, heaven and the highest heavens belong to the Lord your God, also the earth with all that is in it. The Lord delighted only in your fathers to love them, and he chose their descendants after them, you above all peoples as it is this day. So God delighted in the people of Israel. He also says to them, I didn't choose you because you were the greatest, but I chose you because you're the least. He also said to them, I didn't choose you because you're so good. I chose you because the nations surrounding you are so evil. But God had given himself in commitment to, through a covenant, to the nation of Israel. And so because of this, they have a special advantage over all other people. And in that relationship, he also gave to them communication. He gave to them his word. That's why in Deuteronomy, again, in chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, it says, Hear now, O Israel, the decrees and laws I'm about to teach you. Follow them so that you may live and go in and take possession of the land that the Lord, the God of your fathers, is giving you. Do not add to what I command you, and do not subtract from it, but keep the commands of the Lord your God that I give you. In verses 7 and 8 of chapter 4 of Deuteronomy, he says, For what great nation is there that has God so near to it as the Lord our God is to us, for whatever reason we may call upon him. And what great nation is there that has such statutes and righteous judgments as are in all, his, all this law which I set before you this day? And so God said, I'm giving to you a relationship with me, and it's going to be based fundamentally on my word. And somebody says, well, you know, that's the whole problem with the word of God. There's so much negative in it. Well, in Deuteronomy 5.29, God said, Oh, that their hearts would be inclined to fear me and keep all my commands always so that it might go well with them and their children forever. If they kept my commands, they'd be blessed. I've shared this with you before, but it bears repetition. Some of you may not have heard me share this before. When I grew up in my home, my mom and dad didn't get saved until I got saved, and I got saved when I was 20 years old. So my mom had developed some habits that she had, you know, as from childhood that she carried into her marriage. And one of the habits my mom had was she smoked. And my mama used to put a cigarette in her mouth and she'd go to the kitchen stove and she would light her cigarette. She'd turn on the, the burner and she'd bend down with the cigarette in her mouth and she'd just take, you know, she'd light it that way and I can still remember and I was a little boy looking at my mom as she'd light up her cigarette and then she'd kind of lean her head up and then the smoke would kind of waft in and it looked like oh I've got the coolest mom in the world I mean and she just oh she's so cool with that cigarette in her mouth and I really admired it now my mom used to say stay away from fire fire burns that's a command it's going to bless you stay away from it so I'm 14 or 15 and I'm taking up the habit of smoking and I'm thinking my mom looks so cool when she lights that cigarette on that burner and I used to wear a pompadour I don't even know if anybody in this room knows what that is but it was like you know it's one of those hairdos where it's kind of cool and you know and I used to spray it with uh, hairspray I mean it was so hard it was like a, a helmet you know and and I got my cigarette out I turned on the burner and I put my head next to that fire. <laughs> I had the first afro in Norwalk. My hair caught on fire, man. I mean, it was just smoking like Wile E. Coyote, you know. And my mom had said, stay away from fire. Stay away. It burns. I, I, I can tell you she's right. <laughs> stay away from fire. It burns. Commands that God gave to us, so many times people will say, oh, those are so negative. Why is he just raining on our parade? Why doesn't he allow us to do what we want? He says, I want you to keep my commands so you'll be blessed. 
not only will you be blessed, he says, but your children after you will be blessed. Do these things and you'll live. And I want to bless your life. And so God said, my commands are not grievous. They're not burdensome. They're, they're things that I'm giving to you to safeguard you and bless your life. And, and so that's God's heart towards us. And he gave these laws to the nation of Israel. And so these people have great advantage, even as he says, again, verse 1 and 2, what advantage then has a Jew or what is a prophet of circumcision much in every way? Chiefly because to them were committed the oracles of God. Their greatest advantage is they have God's word. Well, as he continues into verse 3, he says, For what if some did not believe? Will their unbelief make the faithfulness of God without effect? And then he answers that, certainly not. Indeed, let God be true, but every man a liar, as it is written, that you may be justified in your words and may overcome when you're judged. And so they have great advantage in every respect. But what happens when people don't believe? Is it better to have no knowledge than to have some knowledge of God's word? Well, Paul's answer would be to have some knowledge of his word is good. Because it lays a moral foundation. And not only that, it also gives great advantage to those who are presenting the gospel. Because that person who has some understanding of the Bible is easier to reach than the one who has no understanding. Now I began to wonder, in our society at this time, how many people actually still believe that the Bible is inspired by God? How many people actually believe that, that we have God's Word contained in what we call the Bible? The word Bible is the word Greek word biblos. It, it speaks of book, and what we really have is we have 66 books that have been compiled into the single book that we refer to as the Bible, broken down into two sections, Old Testament 39 books and New Testament 27. We have 66 inspired books, each one of them individual books that have been compiled into the single book that we refer to as our Bible. And so I was wondering how many people actually understand that this is something that has been given to us over the course of some 1,500 years by over 40 writers in three different languages and yet it compiles into and has a single account of God's redemptive plan through Jesus Christ that you can find from Genesis to Revelation. How many people actually believe that? And so I was wondering concerning that, and so I looked up a Gallup poll, and as I looked up the Gallup poll concerning this question, how many Americans still believe uh, in the Bible, uh, the response is interesting. A 2011 Gallup poll reveals that three in 10 say that the Bible is the literal word of God. 49% say that it is the inspired word of God, but should not be taken literally. But only 17% only believe it is only an ancient book of stories recorded by man. So the fact that we have a large percentage of Americans who still believe that the Bible is God's word is a tremendous advantage. When I present the gospel, I can refer to books of the Bible. I can say, you know, John 3.16 says, God so loved the world. I can point that out. And I can point out various scriptures about what God says. And, and the average American still to this day may, uh, may not have a Bible, may not read the Bible. But when it's quoted, will listen. They still do. And so there's a great advantage in having the word of God because you can present to them what God's word has to say. But within that question is verse three, when he says, well, what if some do not believe? So Paul is now answering Jewish arguments that are posed against the Christian faith. And the question that he's dealing with is what, what if some didn't believe? Undermining that particular question or the foundation of that is, is simply the, the belief that it's not their fault if they don't believe. Well, it's not their fault if they don't believe the Bible, is what they're saying, but Paul's argument would be very simple. He'd say, that's, that's not a good argument. Why? Well, because the Old Testament contains enough information for them to see Messiah. The Scripture contains hundreds of prophecies that reveal Jesus and salvation. So it's no excuse to say that I don't believe that simply because I choose not to. Because my unbelief does not make God into a liar. Let God be true and every man a liar. God's word is true. And it's my problem when I reject what God's word has to say. When Jesus was speaking on one occasion, he said this. It's found in John 5, 39. He said, 
You search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and these are they which testify of me. He was speaking to his opponents, and he was saying, you ransack the Bible. You're looking for all kinds of small things, nuances and all, and you're, you're missing the entire picture. The whole picture is that it's referring to Messiah who's to come, and it's speaking, Jesus was saying, of himself. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15, he was speaking to Timothy there, and he said, from infancy you've known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus, which is why it's a wise thing if we're parents to raise our children in the knowledge and nurture of God's word, you're laying a foundation in their life that you can appeal to later on. My children, when they were growing up, got devotions every day of their life. My children didn't get devotions only two nights out of the week. They didn't get devotions on Wednesday night. My children did not get devotions on Sunday night. And the reason they didn't is because they were here in church on Wednesday night and Sunday night. But Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, I gave them devotions. If I was not there, my, my wife Marie gave them devotions. We laid a foundation in our children's life because the Word of God teaches us to do that. Train up a child in the way he should go. When he is old, he will not depart from it. So it's my responsibility to lay the fundamentals, the foundations into their life because even if they depart for a while, even if they start going out trying to craft their own lifestyle or to reject God and all, they have had something built into their life so that I can appeal to that. I can, I can say, you were raised differently. You know what God's word has to say about this subject. You are, you're sinning against the light, and you know that. And so it's a wise thing to lay foundations in the lives of your children. And that's why Paul said to Timothy, who was raised by a Jewish mother with a, his, his dad was a, a Greek who didn't even believe in, 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 in God as a Jew did. He said, your mother and your grandmother have laid the foundation, the fundamentals of faith in you, and they taught you from the time you were an infant what God's Word has to say. Is there an advantage? Absolutely. Absolutely. But what happens when they don't believe? Well, the question isn't that they don't believe. The question is, why don't they believe? Hebrews chapter 4, verse 2 gives the answer. We also have had the gospel preached to us, just as they did, but the message they heard was of no value to them because those who heard did not combine it with faith. So to hear is one thing, to hear and do is another. God never calls me just to hear. God calls me to hear and to do. And it's in the doing that I demonstrate that I am actually hearing. Well, does unbelief nullify God's faithfulness? His answer in verse 4, certainly not. Let God be true and every man a liar. Man's Faithlessness does not annul God's faithfulness. Just because somebody refuses to believe doesn't make God the liar. They're just refusing to believe. I could be holding a, a loaded pistol in my hand and I could be believing that, that it's really unloaded. And I could pull the trigger and find out that indeed it was loaded. My rejection of the fact that it was loaded simply by saying I don't believe it's loaded doesn't nullify the fact that it is. And God's word, simply because somebody says, oh, I just don't believe it's the word of God, doesn't nullify God's faithfulness. It simply reveals the man's unfaithfulness and unbelief, the refusal to believe. In 2 Timothy 2.13, it says, if we are faithless, he will remain faithful, for he cannot deny himself. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 18 says, it is impossible for God to lie. Well, taking it another step in verse 5, but... If our unrighteousness demonstrates the righteousness of God, what shall we say? Is God unjust who inflicts wrath, I speak as a man? Certainly not. For then, how will God judge the world? So since you begin to speak of grace, and this is an argument the Jews were using against Paul, should we not continue in sin so grace abounds even more? Sin is natural for us. It's natural to sin. And because it's natural to sin, it must be how we've been designed. We've been designed to sin. So if this is so, uh, how can we be judged for doing that which is natural for us to do? So should we not continue to sin so that grace covers more sin? How can God judge us when in fact the deeper the sin, the greater the glory of grace? And so they're arguing from that perspective. Listen, the grace of God as is presented by Paul and you find in scripture, is, is a word that speaks relating to, to God giving to us favor that we don't deserve. 
And so when Paul would preach, no matter how deep your sin, God goes deeper still. Well, those who were arguing against him were saying, well, then that means we should continue in sin so that grace could be even more abundant. Some people would say, I don't believe that's a possible argument. I don't even believe that people thought that way. They think that way now. I have spoken to more people than I care to, to remember at the moment who have had that lifestyle as an argument, who have said, listen, if God's grace has been given to me, then I can continue in the life that I was living and still go to heaven because it's by grace that I'm saved through faith and I believe in God and therefore, why are you making an issue of the things that I do or the lifestyle that I live because God doesn't judge me. I mean, some people even go so far as to tattoo that on their chest. Only God is my judge. Well, the bottom line is you cannot use the grace of God as an excuse. You cannot use the grace of God to continue in sin. Well, that's right. I'm glad that, I'm glad that my mom's here today. She clapped. That's true. You don't take the grace of God and extend it to give you permission to continue in sin. On one occasion, there was a uh, Jewish man. His name was Simon. Simon invited a young rabbi by the name of Jesus to come for dinner. Jesus showed up. It was presented to Simon, seated in the place of honor at the table, and was there with some guests when there was a sound that drew people's attention. They turned and they looked, including Simon. And there was a woman walking into the room. And as she stood there at the door and she began to look around to try and find the place of honor that she might approach Jesus, she, she was noted by the people. Simon noted her. When her eyes finally fell on Jesus Christ, she began to weep uncontrollably. Her tears began to run down her cheeks and pull up on her chin as she had made her way finally to this rabbi by the name of Jesus. And the tears began to drip off of her chin and began to land softly on his feet. And she noticed that there was dust on his feet because the tears began to make small rivulets. And without thinking, she knelt down and she took her hair and she undid her hair, which was a very shameful thing for a woman to do in public. But she let her hair down, and as she let her hair down, she took Jesus by her hands and held his feet, and she began to dry his feet with her hair. And as she held his feet in her hands, she was overcome with gratitude, and she kissed his feet. Simon was there watching this. He's a Pharisee. The word Pharisee means separated one. He's a religious individual who's known for his righteousness, at least self-righteousness. He began to think within himself, and he said, if this man truly were a prophet, he would know who and what manner of woman this is that is touching him, for she's a sinner. That was just a polite way of saying she's a prostitute. And it doesn't take a prophet to know a prostitute when you see one. Jesus says, Simon, I have something to say to you. Say on. There was a man who had two men who owed him Money. One owed a great sum of money, and the other so, uh, owed him a lesser amount. But the man who was owed the money completely forgave both of those men their debts. I'm going to ask you a question, Simon. Who's going to love him the most? Simon says, well, I suppose the one who owed the most. And Jesus says, and this you have said correctly. This woman, Simon, do you see her? You see, Simon didn't see women. He just saw t test cases. He's just, he didn't see people. He, do you see her? You see, Simon, when I came in, you didn't afford me the three basic courtesies that are afforded to every guest in a Jewish home. You didn't anoint my hair with oil. You didn't give me a kiss of greeting. You didn't wash my dusty feet from walking in the roads in the sandals. You didn't do any of those. On the other hand, Simon, this woman hasn't ceased kissing my feet. She's anointed me with her tears. This woman is a sinner indeed, but he said, there's a principle I want you to learn, Simon. The one who has been forgiven much, loves much, loves much. Listen, 
when you come into contact with Jesus Christ and you realize what he has done in your life, how much he's forgiven you, you're going to love him much. And when you love him much, you're not going to be arguing with people like me about your rights to go out and party, drink, and sleep around and still go to heaven. Because you will re realize that those are sins that God, Jesus Christ, placed on the cross. And when a person argues that they have the freedom to continue in sin so that grace may abound, it's like kissing the tip of the spear that was plunged into the side of Jesus Christ. You do not take the grace of God lightly. And that's the argument that Paul is having right now. Shouldn't we continue in sin? Now, if it's natural for us to do that, how can God judge us? How can God judge us for doing that which is natural for us? And by the way, seeing that God's grace is deeper than our sin, shouldn't we continue doing what is natural for us? Because doesn't that bring more glory to God? If we have a natural disposition to sin, how can we also be deserving of judgment? Well, though I may have a natural disposition, God is a righteous judge and God will judge me for my sin. Psalm 94, 23, he has brought on them their own iniquity and shall cut them off in their own wickedness. The Lord our God shall cut them off. You see, God's judgment is right. In Nahum chapter 1, verses 2 and 3, it says, God is jealous, and the Lord avenges. The Lord avenges and is furious. The Lord will take vengeance on his adversaries, and he reserves wrath for his enemies. The Lord is slow to anger and great in power and will not at all acquit the wicked. The Lord has his way in the whirlwind, and in the storm and the clouds are the dust of his feet. And so Paul's argument would be, though it may be natural for you, God is a righteous judge and he will deal with your sin. He goes on in verses 7 and 8 and he says, For if the truth of God has increased through my lie to his glory, why am I also still judged as a sinner? And why not say, let us do evil that good may come, as we are slanderously reported, and as some affirm that we say, their condemnation, he says, is just. You're saying that I teach that the more wicked a person is, the more he glorifies God? That's not true. You're misunderstanding grace. Grace is intended to set you free to serve God, not to continue living a sinful life. God gives you his grace to set you free. Speak to the alcoholic when the alcoholic is sober and when the alcoholic is being honest and ask that alcoholic whether or not their life is pleasing to them, whether they enjoy it. And in their more sober moments, in their more honest moments, they will say to you, I'm in bondage. I'm in bondage to this habit. I can't take it anymore. Speak to the drug addict or speak to the person who is in bondage to their anger and ask them, are you happy the way that you are? And when they're honest, they'll say, no, I'm not. Well, what are you? I'm in bondage. I'm a slave to this. And we can say the same thing. Those of us who've been set free from that can say, yes, that's exactly what I was. I was in slavery to my temper, slavery to the alcohol, slavery to the drugs, slavery to the immorality and all the rest of the things that I used to do. I violated God's law, yes, indeed. I did not give him the honor that was due his name, nor did I care for people. I didn't love God with everything within me, nor did I love my neighbor as myself. The only thing I loved was me. I was my own God. I worshiped at my own throne. I did the things that I wanted. But then God broke through through the gospel of Jesus Christ and expressed to me his grace and how he can set you free and he can take you at one time we were a captive and he can put your feet on solid ground and set you free to walk with him. And the Holy Spirit can empower you and transform your life and you can become unrecognizable to those who know you best because God has done such a transforming work of grace in your life. And now you're walking in the grace of God. What, should we continue in sin so that grace may abound? God forbid. How can we who have been set free from sin live any longer therein, Paul would say. I have been set free by Jesus Christ. And in Galatians 5, 13 and 14, Paul said, For you, brethren, have been called to liberty. Only do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For all the laws fulfilled in one word, even this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The body of Christ today in the 21st century in the year 2013 needs to learn this lesson again. It's not about me. It's not about you. It's about him. It's about what he has done and what he can do. He sets the captive free 
so that we might be free indeed through Jesus Christ. That's how it works, and that's what God has called us to. So the argument, shall we continue in sin so that grace may abound, receives a resounding no. We have been set free from sin. Therefore, with this body, let us serve the Lord who bought us with a price. Let us love Jesus with all that's within us.